afternoon, wherever you are, wherever you are. Hmm. It is my pleasure in order to share some information. I don't know even if it's information, but just to share something. So first of all, maybe some of you know where, where I come from, but I just like to share this so it kind of sets the scene, the stage or whatever. I, I started to stutter, I think, when I was about three years old. And I was a covert stutterer and many, many ways to hide it. I was so ashamed of it. My father stuttered. And, and, and I'm going to throw something out here too, because I've got some different ideas about some things. So just either take them or say, no, that doesn't apply to me. And then I, I went to a workshop with John Harrison in Cleveland, where he told me that you can emulate someone. And I can remember walking up to him after the workshop was over, hanging on his neck and crying and saying, that's why I stutter. I emulate my father so that he will love me. So I just throw up that one out. So I, I had stuttered for about 50 years when on January the 21st, 1989, I went to a workshop in Toronto that I thought was all about money because it was called Born Rich. And I was a single parent at the time, so I thought, oh, good. However, what it taught me is how important what we think about matters in our life. In other words, what I hold in my thoughts manifests in my life. And on the way home, I can still remember the spot on the highway, on the 401, on the way home, when I looked at my boss who had taken me to this workshop and just said to her, I don't, I don't have to stutter anymore. And I had no idea how or if or what that was about at all. But first of all, I knew that there was hope for me and I thought, wow, that's interesting. And then for the speech after that. Well, I came home from that seminar wanting to be a perfect 100% fluent speaker, which, you know, there's hardly anybody alive that's a 100% fluent speaker. And then, then one morning I looked at myself in the mirror and I asked myself why I didn't like the stutter. And probably the first time I had ever asked. And the answer was immediately, because you won't like me if I stutter. This was where this immense fear came for me. And from that point on, my focus has been on self-acceptance, which you have talked about before. Loving, accepting me, whether I stutter or not. Moving beyond the fear. And then I read another book by Napoleon Hill that I thought was about money and it was called Think and Grow Rich. And in that book, he lists six of our main fears. And the first is the fear of poverty. And the second is the fear of rejection. And I just knew that that was my biggie. The fear of rejection. Why? Because the fear of rejection is one of our deepest human fears. We're anxious about being demeaned. We fear being alone and we dread change. So perhaps you can look at and see where, where does the fear of, of rejection show up in your life? Has anybody got anything to share about that? other than speaking? I'll share real quick. Um, so my stuttering experience is different because I started to stutter at the age of 36 because of a brain um, injury. And my stuttering was very prominent um, at first. And then as I re 
rehabilitated from my brain injury, it became less prominent. It's still there sometimes, but, um, and so my experience with stuttering um, is, is a little bit different, but um, I can talk to fear of rejection with my experience of lung disease, for sure. Um, because once you're rejected once, you are afraid of getting rejected. I had an employer once, um, everybody that knows me knows that I teach my graduate courses from the hospital and I do everything when I'm hospitalized, I just don't stop doing stuff. Um, and one time, very quickly, I gained a new employment setting, which was really, really exciting. And the first weekend I was to meet with my new students, um, I was I was hospitalized. <laughs> And this was a new setting. I thought, okay, I'm gonna have to disclose to these students right away about my condition. It was really, really nerve wracking. Um, so I disclosed my situation um, to the students. And the next morning I got a call and I was fired um, for, for doing that. Um, when all of my other employment entities had appreciated my situation, um, et cetera, but this other entity did not. Um, I was fired essentially for my disability. And so since that happened, I can really, really um, hear you when you say, you know, fear of rejection, because every time I apply for a job or even days on the job, I'm absolutely terrified. Someone's going to say something because my voice wasn't loud enough or someone's going to say something and I'm going to lose my job because of <laughs> my diagnosis. Um, so I can really, really relate um, to what you're saying, Mary. Thanks for sharing with us. It, it, it shows up in many ways in my life anyway, besides the fear of speaking, it shows up. So here are, here are a couple of definitions of fear. It's a fantasized experience that appears real. And I've been thinking a lot about that lately because I just moved out of my apartment, sold everything, and I am now in Unity Village, which is just outside Kansas City. So, I mean, there are lots of changes in my life. A fantasized experience, but it's a fantasized experience so many times. Mind you, sometimes the fear is real if we're being chased or whatever, but I'm talking about the other kind of fear, and I think about that. Another definition is faith that the wrong thing is going to happen. There's another definition that I might say here that I probably won't be tuned off for, but it's F everything and run. And that can happen in our life too. I actually said that in church a couple of weeks ago. Anyway, yeah. And then, then I read a book by Leonard Shaw and it's called Love and Forgiveness. And then it, it told me that there are only two emotions that under everything else, there's either love or there's either fear. And so that was also working for me too. Because if I'm not coming from love, then I have to be coming from fear. So first of all, I started to look at what thoughts I was thinking. What am I thinking about? Now, we have about 60,000 thoughts a day and about 75% of them are negative and about 75% of the same ones that we had yesterday. Now, this isn't so that you can get upset and depressed. This is for your awareness. And so, so in order to go beyond the fear that was here for me, then I have to take action and I have to watch what I'm thinking about. It can be baby steps. It can be one step at a time. I also started to look at change. And I had never thought about change. I was scared about change. Change is inevitable. And it's happening whether we know it or not. And I woke up one morning knowing that when I change one little letter in the word change, I get the word chance. And that's what this journey for me has been all about. It's being a chance to be who I really am. Not to be, I, uh, not 
and it, and it's not focused around the speech, but it's focused around the whole person rather than just the speech. Hmm. The people and circumstances in my life that have the most to teach me bring me the greatest challenges. So is there anybody in your life that is bringing you challenges these days? No? <laughs> hmm. Me? <laughs> yeah. That's that's so true. Thank you for that. Because sometimes we look outside ourselves for something that is bothering us when it's really happening within us and not within the other person. Thank you very much for that. Hmm. Because the people and the circumstances in my life that have the most to teach me also bring the greatest challenges. I'm just going to throw this in too. I, I don't know. I, I was surprised that stuttering could also become my comfort zone. Has anybody ever thought about that? I used it as an excuse. I used it as an excuse not to attend university. I didn't go to university because I was scared that I would have to stand up and make presentations. Can anybody else relate to that at all? No? Hmm. Yes, I can relate. Oh, Beam, hi there. Hi, Mary, everybody. Yeah. Yeah, the same, same here. That's why, that's why I went back to 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 school many years later, just to just to face my 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 demons and to and to and to do what I always wanted and to study what I wanted. But Mary, I want to go back to what you said earlier about um, uh, I um, I never had anyone teasing me, bullying me, telling me I shouldn't stutter or anything like that. I put all of that negativity on myself as a very young child from the time I remember from the time I was four. Mm -hmm. I put all of I don't I don't remember it coming from anybody. I put it all on myself from the time I was four. Yeah. 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 Hey, Michael. How are you, Mary? You're looking well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really it's it's really been a lesson for me that it goes so 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 far beyond stuttering and in your workshop I think it was Lucy they talked about self-acceptance and that is the biggie thing for me whether I stutter whether I'm how old I am I just turned 85 holy shit and and I mean, I hopped in my car and I drove for hours and I'm in Kansas City. And sometimes we limit ourselves that we have about who we are and what we can do. Hey, Mary. Hey, Paul. I haven't seen you for a little while. <laughs> True. Uh, I believe it was Baltimore. <laughs> I think so. Anyway, uh, it's interesting uh, it's what we're told 
we can and cannot do or accomplish in our lives. Uh, if any of you of the folks here were in a couple other presentations, I have spoke of this to some degree, but uh, when I was in the job corps, who's who's sent me to college, uh, I was I was a product of the sixties. <laughs> When we had in our minds, we wanted to save the world. <laughs> and I wanted, and I wanted to become a social worker. So I enrolled for social study sciences. And Briefly after I began, my guidance counselor <laughs> invited me into her office and said, uh, Paul, uh, this might not be the best choice for you. And I said, why? What's wrong with trying to help people? Well, It's because of the severity of your speech impediment. How are you going to communicate with the people you're trying to help? And it shattered my world. <laughs> it absolutely destroyed me I, because I thought I could do some good. Well, I said, okay, what's my next course of action? A total 180, I got into engineering, uh, and I became a civil engineer, and we which led me to a job to become a traffic studies engineer, unbeknownst to me how that path would take me to a place where I was expected to communicate with people on a daily basis, on the phone, in public, at workshops, community. <laughs> so I didn't get into social work, but I found another path that allowed me to communicate and tell people. And so, you know, regardless of the path we're on or the choices, or the choices were offered, just because you turn down for one thing, does not mean it will not lead to something far greater. Yeah. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So let's let's look at this fear stuff. Fear is a state of mind, as I said. It's a negative thought that we have about who we are. And it's a situation where our self-esteem isn't where it should be. So uh, is there any other place in your life, too, where this is happening? And when I read this definition of fear, then suddenly this thing that I didn't have a name for that was present every day of my life had a name. It didn't seem so formidable anymore. And David Block, who, if, 
if you've been to a CSA conference, Canadian Stuttering Conference, maybe you know him. Anyway, David Block wrote this about the words, fear is just a negative thought. This thing that most of us have that stops us from doing things, this overpowering force that takes control of us, this thing now can be called, and now can be something tangible, this thing called fear is just a negative thought. So what is the negative thought that we have about ourselves? Okay. You don't have to answer that, but I might be able to I don't have that. any anymore. Oh, that's <laughs> bullshit. Pardon me. <laughs> When I took my stuttering apart, and it took me until I was 46 years of age to do so, and Mary is talking about fear and what we attach to it and what drives us, like what is our trigger, what drives it. And I dealt with this every day of my life. It was the biggest burden I ever had, and it's called anticipatory anxiety. Mm -hmm. I anticipate every speaking situation going wrong. So therefore, I developed holding back and avoidance, and I would go out of my way not to speak to people. And what Paul was saying was like listening to a mirror image of myself. I got a beating off a nun when I was four. Up until then, I spoke no problem. After I get into the beating, I didn't speak for three months. So when I spoke again, I stuttered. Mm. And one day I changed schools in the meantime. And one day my teacher was out sick and we went into the principal's class. And all that I knew about the principal was he shouted a lot and he banged a rule that he had a meter long with a brass barrel on each end of it. He banged it off the desks to make nice and frighten his class or his pupils. And I ended up in his class. The first day weren't funny, didn't give me any attention. Second day, he asked me a question. I was seven years of age and I couldn't say it. And I blocked and I blocked and I blocked. And if any of you had gone that was loaded and said to me, Say that word or I'll blow it off. You better pull the trigger because that's mm. the beat. But anyway, he lost his temper and he said, hold out your hands. And I did. And he pulled back the stick with such ferocity that I pulled my hand back and he leaned forward and he stumbled. And he was worse. The anger, he turned white with temper. I remember, I can see it now. I can see the school. I can see the classmates. And he hit me again and he held my hand this time. There's a mark on my hand still. He drew blood. And the mark has moved with age. It's there. But he used me on the fleshy part of my hand there. And uh, he drew blood. For the second time, because of a teacher, I wet my pants. The first time I was with the nun. The second time was that day. And I sat in that wet pants all day. I lived two miles away from school. But... The message I got at seven years of age was quite clear. It was quite clear that I could not stutter in front of adults because it would end up in physical pain. At four and at three, I didn't understand what trauma was. It took me 29 years to find out what trauma was. And that's what it was. But the important lesson, and it's a lesson I cherish for the rest of my life, is this. I learned that I had to overcompensate in everything I'd done in my life just to feel normal. I don't get it when people say, oh, I don't mind if I stutter. I mind it. I minded that burden of stuttering every day. There was three situations in my life where it caused mm. And that's a true story. But as I tell people now about stuttering, don't look at your stuttering. Look at all the skills, talents, and resources that is 
within everybody on the screen that has brought you to where you are in life now. We are powerful people. It's how we look at ourselves is what brings us down. I became self-employed 45 years ago. I had 45 pounds, a clapped out van that cost me 200 pounds. Oh, okay. And well, I, I got through life. All of you are getting through life. So, yeah. You said, if you said something there, Michael, that I'm going to share with you hmm. and, and with everybody else, and whether you want to take it or not, that's up to you. When I was working, and I refer to it as my stuttering, the boss's secretary asked me if I wanted to own it. And I said, no, I don't want to own it. I have never called it my stuttering since then. It's always the stuttering. Yeah. Take yeah. it or leave it or do whatever you want with it. I want to get back to this fear of rejection that we have that shows up, up in our life. That, that what someone else thinks about us has nothing to do with who we are. Can I say that again? What someone else thinks about us has nothing to do with who we are. But what we think about ourselves has everything to do with who we are. And what you think about me is really what you think about yourself. What you think about me is what you think about yourself. Has anybody read The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz? I would suggest you read it. That's a suggestion because it outlines agreements that we can make with ourselves to replace some of those old negative beliefs that we have about who we are. And the second agreement in that book is the one I love the most is don't take anything personally. Okay, read the book. Big lesson, because if someone says you're thoughtless and inconsiderate, it's not about you. Who is it about? It's about them. Now, we don't look at them and say, yeah, 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 that's not about me. That's about you. No, we don't do that to them. But we come from this place of understanding that it's not about us that we're talking, but that they're talking about, but they really experience some of their own feelings. Because what someone says and what someone does, and this also refers to us, and the opinions they have are according to their beliefs, to the agreements that they've made with themselves. Their point of view, just like our point of view, comes from all the programming that they've received during their life. And how many times do we think that someone else knows more about who we are than we do? And so, we, and so we take what they say about us to be the truth of who we are. Can you think of any circumstances in your life? where that's happening. That you are believing what someone else says about you rather than knowing that it's not about you, that it's about them. And as I say, this, this isn't to go wah, 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 you know, but it's an understanding. I wish I'd have known that when I was a kid and someone laughed at me when I stuttered.
I stopped speaking for a while and I used to write on a blackboard. I was so scared. The learning lesson. The learning lesson. Because when, when we take things personally, any kind of things personally, then we feel offended. And our reaction is to defend our beliefs and create conflicts. Hang on for a minute. I'm going to ask him if he can mow the front yard and not the backyard. Here is Mary's book. I think it just came out. I got it on Amazon. Yes, it did. It just came out. I haven't read it yet, but I got it. I have about 25 books I need to read. It's in my pile. Oh, Tom has it too, yeah. Yeah. I got an email the other day from a woman in Australia who had read the book and who could so relate to the story, my story, and anyway, so, and then I got another email from a girl in the Netherlands who has a copy of the book. So it's out on Amazon all over the place. It is such a blessing. I, I don't know how much time have we got left? N not that much time. You have hey, uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. I have I, I had a bunch of stuff written down, but I'm thinking, you know what? One one of the most important um, conversations that I ever had was at an NSA convention. Oh, with who, who recommended voluntary stuttering? I'm 85 and sometimes my thoughts, anyway. Sheehan, jo Joseph Sheehan, uh, he was the one who spoke about voluntary stuttering. And I spent some time with his wife. I, I can still remember sitting there with her and she, she recommended that I start to do voluntary stuttering. And that was one of the major things that changed my life. Also, I, I found out being, being a covert stutterer that there were patterns of, of how I spoke. And so for I don't know how many weeks I got up every morning and I read from Think and, Think and Grow Rich again. <laughs> anyway, for, for 20 minutes every morning, not to be fluent, but to just change these patterns in my speech. And so sometimes we get ideas that maybe nobody else is talking about, but seem to be right for us. And so I would invite you really, you know, to follow your heart and to see what seems right for you, really. I, I, I was asked to speak at a conference in Chicago. I think it was in the late 1990s. And the title of the conference was The Gift of Stuttering. And I had never looked at it as a gift. I'm going to cry. <laughs> I had never looked at it as a gift before. But it has been my gift because it has allowed me to look inside and to find out and to meet people and to travel and awesome. And now, yes, you would like to speak or say something, hon. I don't know how to say your name. Can I? Um, yeah. Uh, um, yes. Um, uh, it's Kanal. Um, Mary, um, just a quick question for you, uh, big because I, I know you mentioned you're uh, you're 85 now, and just wanted to hear um, 
uh, I, I I didn't say it. You said it. You know? <laughs> so, uh, um, but, but but like one question I have for you is: Do you feel like throughout your life you you've kind of um, j just you you know just as 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 you've just just as as you, like um, just throughout life have you still gone like ups and downs still like you know more accepting to less accepting to more accepting to, l to less accepting just um j just as, as you've kind of went throughout your life or, or or has it do you feel like it's just like continued to be on an upward trajectory in terms of like overall acceptance and well it all depends whether whether you're whether you're talking about the stuttering i i don't really care if i stutter any any, any yeah, so, so, sorry, I'm, sorry. I, I'm not talking about you know level of stuttering. I'm talking about your own attitude to, toward towards it. Um, ha, do you feel like it's always kind of gone up, or you still have kind of ups and downs still as you as you um, as you went throughout life? I, I I still have ups and downs. I don't have the fear of rejection so much. But as I said before, I just quit my job. I went. I went back to school in 2003, and I became a minister, a unity minister. And so anyway, I just retired from the ministry at the end of last year. I moved out of my apartment at the end of February. I stayed with a friend until the end of April. And then I drove. I don't know how many miles from Ontario to Kansas City. And was I scared sometimes? Yes, I was. And I still have fear. I think fear will always be a part of my life, but not to the same extent that it was before. It doesn't hold me back now, whereas before it used to hold me back. And it doesn't hold me back very often now. But has it completely left my life fear? No, it hasn't. No, in fact, a friend of mine, I was, um, I, I was out with him before I actually started on my way down here, and, and I, and I was talking about the fear that is still there. Okay, does that answer your question? No. Now I'm aware of it. Now I can talk about mm -hmm. it. Now, now I'm not yeah. ashamed to say that that fear is there. Hey, Mary. Yes. I have to correct myself with regards to having fear after you're calling me out and saying bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> because you are correct, except for when it comes to stuttering, I have no fears. No, I don't either. Have I got other fears? Yes, I do, because I'm in a transitional state in my life as well, and I don't know where I'm going to end up. Right now, I'm in this beautiful place, and I have been for almost three years now. Mm. Uh, it's been sold, and I'm going to have to leave, and I have to find a senior apartment. <laughs> so I'm in a state of transition, and all these things bring fear because I don't know where I'm going to end up. I don't know what I'm, how I'm going to do it or adjust. So... You're correct, dear. You're absolutely correct. Wow. We all still have fears. And Lord knows I do. And I apologize for saying I have no fears because that is bullshit. <laughs> you were correct, my dear. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Well, really, it, it, it's a journey that that really never ends. And whether it's yeah, whether it's focused on stuttering or not stuttering, or it goes whatever. on and on. Yeah, it it just keeps going on and on. And anyway, and I there is a there's a chapter in in my book about forgiveness because I think that's an important part of this journey. 
there's a there's a chapter in the book about gratitude about being grateful like i am so grateful for my life and for all the people who've shown up in it and for all the gifts that they have brought me it's i i was going to use a word i can't use it's amazing really and you know what we never know where uh, but there, there's an important lesson I've learned, and that is when something feels right in my heart, I say yes to it. Yes to it. And whether it works out or not, that's okay. I can find out. I never thought I would be a minister. You know, I called my ex-husband and told him, and there was just silence. <laughs> I can remember, hey, I'm going back to school and I'm 66 and I'm going to be a minister. And there was complete and utter silence. He wasn't the only one surprised I was. What do you mean? So anyway, and you know what? Laughter is so important, man. If you can't laugh, Doug Scott. Hey there, how hey, are you? Hey, holy shit. It's good to <laughs> see you. <laughs> It's very good to see you too. Oh God, I miss everybody. Yes, it's awesome. <laughs> oh my gosh. Anyway, hello everybody, and thank you, thank you for for sharing your insight during during our time together. You know, because this is how I learn. I always learn from you all the time. Mm -hmm.